once again, Cynthia McFadden. If you were listening to rock music back in the 70s, you had to be hearing the sounds of one of the wildest, most outrageous talents to take the stage by storm, Meatloaf. 300 pounds of sweating, uncombed attitude on stage. He was always larger than life, and now he's back. And what a story he has to tell. If you loved his act as I did, when do you hear about the torment that produced it? Who is the man behind the music and the myth? He became this figure whenever he stalked on stage. He controlled that stage, he controlled that audience. He would stare down an audience of 10,000 people without even thinking about it twice. He becomes larger than life, and he turns into a beast, a meatloaf beast. It's sweat pouring off of his body. Meatloaf was the most unlikely of rock stars, the ugly duckling whose music rocked the soul of a generation. intensity of opera and the themes of teenage broken hearts. If they were confessional, it was with an amplified heartbeat. It wasn't just the music and its themes of sex and car crashes that transfixed much of American youth, but the man himself, a 300-pound anti-hero who very nearly self-destructed. To understand Meatloaf's rise, fall, and rise again, you have to go back to Texas in the 1950s and meet a little boy named Marvin. By the time he was seven years old, he weighed nearly 200 pounds, and neighborhood mothers wouldn't let their kids play with him. Because of his weight, even his name became painful to him, all because of a radio ad he heard as a kid. And I remember the first time I heard it. Well, poor fat Marvin can't wear Levi's. How did they know? Because I couldn't. Even as an adult, the name Marvin can set him off, as this 1987 clip from Irish television shows. I said, it is true, Marvin, that you're a batter of hell album. Who? You're a batter of hell album. No, whoa, whoa, back up, back up, back up. Marvin, what did you call me? Marvin. Marvin. Who's that? So, when I was to meet him for the first time, recently in New York, I didn't want to make any mistakes about the name. Hello. Certainly, Marvin was out, but Mr. Lowe? Nice you. to meet you, too. So, what should I call you? Me. Everybody calls me me. So, meet it was. But where did the name come from? It was his father. He was an alcoholic. He was a good old boy. And, and, and meet was a funny name to call his kid, because I was big. It is ironic that the name that is stuck, the name he embraces, was given to him by an alcoholic father who tried to kill him in a drunken rage the night his mother was buried. And all of a sudden, this butcher knife just comes up, and I roll, and that butcher knife goes right into the center of the bed. And I go, whoa! And I left the house and never went back. Did you ever forgive it? Oh, yeah. Because I'm really not angry at anyone. I'm not mad at anyone. Anymore. Anymore. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody. I mean, if some of these things happen to you when they're going on, whoo-hoo, doggy. <laughs> there was much to forgive. Meat says when he was only seven or eight, he'd go out at night with his mother in search of his often drunk father. Frequently, it was Meat who went into the local bars to bring his father home. Oh, yeah, I learned to act doing that. That's, that's where that skill came from. Because I would go into these bars, this little cannonball walk into this room, and, and, be, and these, you know, they'd turn around and look at me. And I just look back at him like, you touch me and you're dead. I read once that you said you saw yourself as an actor, not a singer. I am an actor. I can't sing. I have to have characters to sing. I didn't dare hope that Meat would actually sing for me. No. That'd be a bad idea. That's a bad idea. But after a few hours of talking, it just seemed to happen. Launching into character as country singing legend Tennessee Ernie Ford. See, now I'm Tennessee Ernie Ford. That's the <laughs> image I got. I'm seeing myself as with this mustache and black hair. And Meat discovered he could gain confidence and even popularity by playing characters. And so the lonely kid moved to Los Angeles and ended up as a professional actor. 
one of the first new characters, Eddie the Zombie, in the cult hit, The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Who would have thought that Eddie the Zombie would next turn up here as an actor at New York's famed public theater? It's not grease paint, it's sawdust. Yes, as a young man, Meat performed Shakespeare here under the direction of the legendary Joe Papp. We're in holy ground here, hallowed ground. See where it says Martinson Hall? Yeah. That's where, that's where I met Jim Steinman, up in Martinson Hall. And meeting composer Jim Steinman would eventually lead to superstardom. The project began as another role for the boy from Texas. There was a character created, this wild, insane King Kong. That was always my first image of him, by the way, was King Kong in a cage with all the people taking photographs. And someone says, no, don't frighten the beast. Don't frighten him. It was just, he was such an extraordinary presence. But it was the age of disco. Think John Travolta in a white suit. Meatloaf, King Kong in a cage, was unlike anything else out there. And for over a year, they shopped the songs around, singing them live to skeptical record companies. Well, we were brutally rejected. I mean, we got dumped on by everybody. Until finally, CBS Records gave them a contract, and Bat Out of Hell was released in 1978. It became one of the soundtracks for a generation. And then it became the biggest selling record in the world, and then everybody wanted to be my friend. And that made you mad. Oh, that made me really mad. All these people that had rejected me and said all these nasty things, all of a sudden now, now you're God's gift to the Western world. You're the next piece of sliced bread. These were the days of excess, on stage and off. And even if Meatloaf was able to turn off the character, he didn't seem to want to. I knew how to do it, but I was so driven that I wasn't going to. That people at that point loved this character. They liked him. I think he was meatloaf 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And it drove him crazy. A exactly, yeah. So when it came to life, meatloaf behaved like, well, meatloaf. There were suicide attempts and drugs. Meatloaf even challenged John Belushi to see who could inhale the most cocaine. Meatloaf says he won. And then the unthinkable, meatloaf stopped singing. He told me it began as a protest, a fake, one day at the studio because he didn't like the new songs Jim Steinman had written. And Jim goes, what's wrong? I said, I told you, I can't sing. If it began as a fake, it became agonizingly real. And he sounded literally like Linda Blair in The Exorcist. I mean, just, it was frightening. And I felt unbelievably for him. I didn't know what to do. And then the lawsuit started. $85 million for canceling performance dates and not recording the second album with Steinman. The man who had been on top of the charts was now destitute. Oh, they took everything. They took everything. And they said that. We're going to take everything you got. You can't stop us. By 1981, his father-in-law had to buy groceries for Meat, his wife, and two little girls. Slowly, over the next year, Meatloaf emerged from the wreckage of his life. He stopped using drugs. He credits John Belushi's death from an overdose. I'm very tenacious. I'm, I'm like that badger. You know about a badger. A badger, if he bites you, you got to kill him. And then, once he's dead, you got to break his jaw to get him off your arm. So, like a badger, he persisted. Slowly, his voice returned, and he began to sing again at little clubs and bars. Finally, in 1993, 16 years after the first album, Meatloaf got back together with Jim Steinman for Bat Out of Hell 2, another mega hit. No, I won't do. And another generation discovered Meatloaf. Thank you! The Meatloaf I met was a slimmer, trimmer model nearly a hundred pounds thinner than his top weight of 343 back in 1981. I actually weighed in the seventh grade um, two pounds less than I weighed this morning. 
he credits the weight loss to his wife of 20 years, Leslie, who says she put meat on what she called a cleansing diet with a lot of fruits. And I made a chart like you make for a child. And so whenever he would go through the day and eat all the foods that he was supposed to eat and the amounts, and he would get it all right, he would get a gold star. Perhaps Meatloaf deserves one of life's gold stars. He's not just surviving, he's thriving. He is currently starring in two new motion pictures, The Fight Club with Brad Pitt and Crazy in Alabama. And his autobiography has just come out. Baby, we can talk all night. What better way to leave Meatloaf, at least for now, than with my favorite Meatloaf song, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. So the man who's been to hell is back. Confidence restored. There's nobody better than me. Nobody. Nobody can touch my show. And it's hard to argue with that. But that ain't getting us no This weekend, Meatloaf kicks off his new North American tour in Albany, New York. And even though he and Jim Steinman don't seem to be talking to each other, both of them told me they'd like to work together again. And coming up next, we've discovered a disturbing trend among young people.